Shit. All right. Um, hi, my name is Kelly. I will be boring you for the next half hour. Um, and if you do see me start bombing anybody that is pregnant and feels like they want to go into labor, please do so. <laughs> um, so a little unknown fact about myself. I was actually raised by wolves, like actual, like real wolves. See, that's, that's me. That's not the wolf. But yeah, there I am. <laughs> so this is photographic evidence of me being raised by my family. It was, I believe, my third or fourth birthday. Notice the little Kermit the Frog hat. Um, so being raised by wolves uh, teaches you a lot of things. And one of those is like animal instinct. And that is how to bite stuff. So after learning how to do that, my family and I, we moved from the US to a mystical place called Australia. So we didn't only just move to Australia, we moved to the dead center of Australia, which is called Alice Springs. And in Alice Springs, there is sand, like a whole lot of sand. Um, the only modern things they had there were like KFC and Kmart. So there was no McDonald's, no Burger King, no any of that. And what was interesting was is that when you're young, you try to find outlets of things to do when you're a young wolf. So my outlet was obviously turning to television. Uh, and luckily for us, we only got one television station. That one television station was BBC One, the British Broadcast Channel. So back then, the things I got to watch were Astro Boy, Voltron, uh, The Goodies, The Young Ones, Monty Python. So <laughs> what I grew up on was basically British dub Japanese anime and dry British humor, which I absolutely adore. Like, it is my favorite thing in the entire world. So, when you fall in love with this kind of stuff, your brain, I think, becomes a little skewed in a certain direction. So after we lived in Australia, we moved back to a mystical land called Florida. <laughs> Florida is mystical for its own reasons, but I will not say what. Um, my family was going through uh, fairly hard times. My mother became a single mother, and we had uh, not a lot of money. So coming up was rather hard. So I decided to basically bring it upon myself to retreat into my own world. Part of my own world was basically retreating into music. And I found this new age music called metal. So with metal came album covers. So that was like Metallica and Megadeth. And I would spend time like drawing and recreating these album covers. And I wish I had photos of them because they were amazing. You would just, you would die if you saw these recreations. <laughs> but I don't. So I would take time and my friends would think I'm cool and, and that's not true. But after a certain period of time, um, my family decided to move once again. And we moved up to a mystical land called Maryland. It was not so merry for me. Like, the family problems came up with that. So uh, once again, I decided to um, retreat. And uh, during that time, am I on a good slide? Yeah. During, during that time, I, um, I, I fell into some people, and we found out about a mystical jungle that was next to Maryland. It was the concrete jungle. You see the one I did there? So being a wolf and being with other wolves, we decided to go into this concrete jungle and explore. And what did we find? We would find gathering of animals. And all these animals were like fighting each other and barking each other and trying to hurt each other for fun. They were called hardcore shows. <laughs> and I would go to these hardcore shows. And it was a great release for what I was feeling inside because I was really fucked up. Like, it, it was just a lot of screwed up things going on in my life. 
And then I found out about another secretive gathering of animals. And it was bizarre because it was really secretive. Like, you had to go get a map to find it because there was no internet during this time. There was internet, but it wasn't as good. It was like AOL. <laughs> but you would have to get a map to go to it. Or you'd have to give someone a paisley dyed hard-boiled egg to get the map to go find where this gathering was. This gathering was called Raves. And they had this amazing stuff at Raves. It was called drugs. <laughs> Holy shit, did they have a lot of drugs at these raves. Um, whether I did them or not is up to debate. And um, I found an outlet through these musical scenes. And during that time, I also found the other outlet from other friends of mine, and it was this other drug called graffiti. And as you can see by this picture, I was not good at graffiti. <laughs> yeah, thanks for laughing at that. Um, and, and that was one of those problems. You know when you're young, you think you're invincible, you think you do nothing wrong. No, I knew I was doing something wrong, and it was really ugly. Um, so what happened was is that I kind of took it upon myself to just revert back to my childhood and like drawing characters with spray paint. And it, it was fun, but then I found out after high school, that there was a, a place of learning knowledge where they could teach you how to be a professional at what you do. And this place was college. So I went to college, and I, <laughs> I did what every young person does. Like, I, I, when you get in their first year as an art student, you try to emulate all the masters or who you think are great at that time. So like Jackson Pollock, and you're fucking throwing paint everywhere. And you're like, oh, I'm the shit. And like, like Chuck Close, and you're putting fucking thumbprints on everything. <laughs> and like your art professor's just fucking dealing with you because he knows what the fuck you're doing, and you're just acting like you're supposed to when you're in the first year of college. So after like two years of like doing that and like getting frustrated, oh. <laughs> she, she's hot. <laughs> um, so I, um, I, I basically. Yeah, she thought. Um, from doing that, I got frustrated. And with that frustration, I went back to music. So I went on tour with friends of mine who were in band. I was a guitar tech and tour managing. And during, it was like a year, year and a half I took off. And during that time, as most wolves do, um, when I, before I left and came back, I had met a hot she-wolf. And um, wow, she was amazing, still is, never mind. Um, but when I came off tour, we were still friends and we basically expressed how we felt to each other. And it's been 16 years since and four years of marriage, which I have to say, I'm so happy that we did that. Um, And we were having a discussion about me going on tour. And it's, it was like almost like a Freudian discussion. It was really crazy. And I remember it vividly to this day. And the discussion was is that she was like, oh, you're on tour. Like, what is, what's your job? And I'm like, oh, my job, you know, it's like babysitting like six to 10 dudes that know they shouldn't be doing dumb shit, but do dumb shit. And I try to keep them out of jail. <laughs> oh, they play music as well. So, she was like, oh, that's cool. So like, you're helping their, make their dreams come true. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you could say that. And she goes, what about you? Are you making your dreams come true? I was like, oh. <laughs> so quit going on tour, went back to school. And I basically reverted back to my graffiti. And I you know, just turned everything into something I knew and was my outlet. Um, flash car. Mm -hmm. You can tell I'm really good at this. <laughs> um, so at this whole time when, when I was in college and on tour, I somehow managed to keep a job. Yeah. Um, I was a, a designer for Whole Foods Market and uh, for 10 years. And basically it was, Every store has their own designer. 
So I'm that guy that made that thing that said avocados 99 cents each. <laughs> I thought they were cool. But in the beginning when they hired me, they were like, I was in the produce department, and I was just doing their chalkboards because I was the artsy guy. And then they were like, look, we, we have to fill a position called store artist. You, you should apply for it. And I got it. And they're like, OK. And they gave me a little computer with a little office. And they're like, all right, learn this program. I was like, oh, what's this? And they're like, Photoshop. I was like, oh. It was like the first Photoshop. So I was like, all right, I'll learn this. And then like, after 10 years, they kept on giving me more. And like, it was Illustrator and InDesign. And it was great because I was getting paid to learn these programs on like college, where you have to pay to, yeah. But what came along was is that I got nominated for a project called the Digital Print Portfolio Project. And it was basically, you were given three eight-hour workdays to work with a digital master printer. And the digital master printer was David Adamson. Um, I didn't know it at the time that him and his gallery represented Chuck Close and Jim Dine and some of the people that I idolized and thought I was being fucking cool by putting thumbprints all over and didn't know. And this project consisted of doing your work, but digitally. So I created, in three hours on my first session, what I wanted to make, because with my background in digital and my background in graffiti, I already knew what I wanted to do. So this was my first actual, what I felt was kind of my first real work. And it was an homage to graffiti, as in the postal stickers, how you know they take postal stickers from the post office for free and then write them write your tag on it and you go slap them everywhere. And it's been done since the 80s and before. And it still goes on. But this was my homage to that. And what I was so stoked on was how it came out. And then the whole project was from DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities. So I researched them more and found out they give you money. They're called grants. You guys should look that shit up. <laughs> it's tight. So. They were, they were, they had one, it was like an artist grant, it was like for two grand or 1500 or something like that. So I was like, okay, well, and I scribbled on a, a bunch more of these postal stickers and I was like, I'm gonna go ask this guy for a show. So I literally went into his gallery and like showed him a, more of these scribbled up postal crumpled stickers. And I was like, hey, if I get like this money from this thing that I could possibly get, but I may not, but whatever, can I have a solo show here? Like, who the fuck does that? Like, you don't just fucking walk into a fucking gallery and just, like, do it. And, like, I, I, he said yes. Like, I was floored. And, and, like, that's one of the things that really blew my mind and started one of my work ethics is that you can never know what you're going to do until you get the balls up enough to do it. You know, it, it's really, it, and this is just on my own sake, it's really hard for, to, to tell someone, just like, go in there and do it. Like, I was just a jackass. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna go try this. And it, and it happened. And there's no rules that make it where you can't make something happen. I've found that out through most of my career. And then when I was proceeding to make the first solo show, they, they asked if they could represent me. And I was like, cool. Does that mean like a handshake? What do you mean represent me? Like, I, I don't like, Rep what? And, and they were like, they're like, no, we want to, we, you know, we'll be representing this. I was like, oh, so wait a second, you've got like Chuck Close and Jim Nine and Jenny Holes, and then, oh, I'm on the bottom of the totem pole. I'm on a totem pole, like, sweet. So this was from uh, 2004, was my first solo show, and it was called Underdog. And it's weird for a wolf to name their show Underdog. You think it would be called Wolf Pack or something like that, but no, it just worked better, because I felt like I was the underdog. And I still feel that way to this day. Like, I'm very, very happy and humble to be doing as much work as I can. But to this day, I still have that mentality of, I need to fight for what I'm going to do. And I'll work as hard as I can, tooth and nail. Um, and it was still carried on the same homage of like these giant postal stickers and like carrying through with it everything that I wanted to express with relating graffiti and digital and what I had at that point. Uh, around 2008, I had my second solo show. That did not go so well. Um, I was just in my own 
personal self really bummed out at what I produced. And it happens to everybody, I believe, but like I kept making work for years. It's just I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't put my full heart into that show and, and it struck a chord on me. And from that, I decided that I wasn't gonna do a show for a while. So I just kept making public works. So most people don't know, but if the sun hits it right, I painted the front of the black cat with a black cat. Um, so it's like dark purple on black and it was a lot of fun, but this was like some of the things I was getting into just like expressing myself visually that I could make things happen. Uh, this is 12th and W, this is a mural called Scout. Uh, and I got this through a grant of DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities. You should ask them for money, it's tight. Um, this is where someone graffitied it. No, no, it's tight. Like, but the bummer about this was is they graffitied two of my pieces on the same night. But they put a giant dick on the other one. But I was really bummed because I was like, you could have put dicks on this one, it would have looked more appropriate. <laughs> can't win them all, but it's fixed. Um, this is a mural I just recently did in Taipei, and it's with collaboration with me, an uh, uh, artist named uh, Dibi, and then another artist named Mr. Ogay, and his name is awesome. Um, oh, don't do that. Yeah, look at me. I know how to work stuff. Thanks, dude. <laughs> this is a mural about booze. <laughs> I think it's appropriate. And that's what I thought you all did. I thought they got everybody in a room and got them all drunk and then said, hey, sign up on this computer to come to see this guy speak. <laughs> but This is Atticus. Atticus is my four-year-old son and he is what made me come back to my zone. You know that zone, you know, like where you're working and you cannot, you don't want anybody to fucking talk to you. You don't want, you just, you're just making your shit and that's it. Like who knows that zone, yeah? My zone smells like spray paint. <laughs> Either way, he is what basically gave my shit like my lost ship and anchor. And um, it was the day he was born that I knew, A, I needed to provide for my family and make stuff happen, but it was also, I realized that things just clicked in my head. And it was that ethic of where I need to work, not just to work, not just to make money, but if I don't work, like I'm not going to be able to do it at any other point. And it's just that mentality of that you have to just unlock yourself. And no one can do it for you. And it's, it's the most unreal thing. And I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not here to say, unlock yourself. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's the truth in all nature. Like, you, you, like whatever, your, whatever your dreams are and whatever your passions are, you, you, you're the only one that's going to stop you from it. So he's the one who like basically put it on like 50 million percent. You know, if someone says, oh, I'm thirsty for this, like I, I need this really bad. I wasn't just thirsty, I was like fucking dehydrated. Like I needed to work so bad. So what happened was is that my next solo show came up and I decided it was eight years after my last one. And um, it was all based on this, the mythological books of uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. I called the show The Death of Ulysses. And it was my version of Odysseus or Ulysses, whichever you want to call him, and how him and his adventures played out. And oh yeah, there's no one. He looks like Mowgli, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> He's so cool. God, that was the best. I wasn't expecting to see him again. So this was my version of Ulysses. And I'll just take you through a couple more. Um, there was Athena. And I just really wanted to have fun with it, bring it to modern day form, and see what I could do with it and not be restrained by my own head. Um, much less like a fable, 
which is like so old, and see how I could turn that on a task. Bless you. Um, Poseidon. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't tell. <laughs> But it's also like in, in shapes and forms, I do this as well as I put people and places and things that are, are fond to me into this. So this is actually Poseidon, but it's also Atticus. This is also my son. So, you know, he's got sushi, but he, you know, he has a fish stick and, you know, he's hanging. So I was realizing when I was wanting to do this show that I was so ramped up on all the things that I could make that I wanted to delve into animation and see how this would work and if my work would fall into that line. And then this is part of the installation that I did, which I built a coffin uh, for Ulysses and painted on the wall. Um, Damn, son, where'd you find this? So let me explain that. <laughs> Obviously, you saw Ulysses, but there is also, you know, some form of dancing happening there. And the girls that are twerking are actually my version of the sirens. It was just my modern day twist on how, like, people are lured into, like, the, the call of, you know, the wily women, and, you know. So that was my, my take on it. I know you guys got it right away. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, but part of the ethic that, that really broke for me was that I don't need to keep making the same graffiti-related things where it has to always completely 100% look like my old stuff or relate to my old stuff. So I started taking stabs at modern visions of, of things and. I, I was, I'm really happy with how it's going, and it's just exciting for me to keep exploring, but trying to kill, still keep it in my same vein, and see how much I can take on in my boat and my ship. And um, this was uh, this man called The Weekend, which is an amazing name. Um, and I do yearly for Sweet Life Festival, I create work for them, and last year they wanted me to create portraits for all the artists for both days, which was immense. And then I got to present the artists with the portraits and everything like that. So this was one of them. This is just awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm just like having fun exploring. I'm really like not taking anything where it's told to me by constraint, which I love. It's, it's one of those rules where people think they have to follow. And I don't know if anybody's figured it out yet, but I don't really fucking follow rules that much. And like, yes, I have inflatables up in the Hirshhorn lobby, so technically that does mean I've exhibited at the Hirshhorn. <laughs> so if there's some rule about that, I completely broke that one. Um, this is Pearls, and she will actually be on auction tomorrow at the Transformer auction. Transformer Gallery is having an auction tomorrow if anybody is going. Um, couldn't tell you what's going on here, but I like it. So this is a mural I created at, in the Navy Arts, and it was a collaboration between me and a gentleman named Jasper Wong. And I don't know if it gives you highs, like you can see the size of it, but that's a bus stop. So this was over six stories tall, um, and it was an old CIA building, and it got demolished. Uh, intentionally, we knew it was getting demolished, but it was luckily for me to have a canvas. And from what I got from this experience is I actually became friends with Jasper Wong. And Jasper Wong actually creates, and f he's the founder of Pow Wow Hawaii. Pow Wow Hawaii is a mural festival, and it is now global, but it originated in Hawaii. And what happens is it's like over 60 of the biggest amazing graffiti and street artists from around the world, everyone goes to Hawaii for two weeks and chills and paints and just makes community, which is rather hard. And that's what I'm loving about DC right now is that DC is growing exponentially fast and our creative community is growing exponentially fast. 
and it makes me happy to no bounds because people always try to comment to me on you know, interviews or this or that or the other. So what do you think about DC's creative community? It's like really small. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> like we're the fastest growing city in the US and we have a lot to prove. But I think in the next five years, it will be proven that you should not fuck with us. So what I'm going to do, So one of my jobs is, is that I have taken it upon myself to actually bring Pow Wow to DC. So I'm going to have a mural festival here in May 2016 of about 20 artists. Um, everybody can talk to me about walls and anything you want to afterwards. I'm more than happy to talk to everyone about creative community and making things happen. But this is one of the things I'm going to bring to DC. Um, it's already happening in Taipei, it's already happening in Japan, it's gonna happen in Jamaica and Israel and a lot of different places, so it's really going to be epic. Um, this is something else that I found out where people feel that you need to have rules. This is a greeting card. <laughs> I think it was originally Chewbacca or something, but I decided to Pack it and just like have fun with it. Uh, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> but it was another one of these things where I wanted to delve into animation and what else I could make move and what else I could turn my work into that visually would make me interested in it. So I came up just recently to I got commissioned for an installation, and this installation took place in what's going to be the Line Hotel, which is Anonymous Morgan. And this installation is something I never thought I'd get into un until I was asked about what I wanted to make. And they were like, well, we want to commission you to do an installation. Everybody's first thought is usually, oh, he's going to do graffiti, or he's going to paint, or he's going to make something. I was like, yeah, I want to do all this, but I was like, I want to do mapping projection. So this is um, what I produced for them, I'm sorry, there's no music. It sounds a lot cooler with music. Um, for that installation in this abandoned church, or a uh, construction site of a church. And I'm really, really happy because my stuff, I feel, now has come to life. And it's going to come to life even more when I have my next installation in Georgetown, the 11th through the 21st, um, if everything goes along as planned. But these are some of the realms where I felt my work can't give me rules, where I don't have to sit there and take anything into account and say, like, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. Like, I'm, I'm just really sick and tired of, of looking at other artists and trying to figure out how they did it. Instead, I'm just trying to do it. And, and that's one of my work ethics is just, like, doing not, not, and just going for it 100%. And at the end of the day, I, I really feel that it's, if you don't have the desire, if you don't have the hunger for it, if you're not hungry like a wolf, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're only gonna stop yourself. But I, I, think, I think in the end, like, you all get the point. So thank you so much for coming out and spending your day with me. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs>